Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. You will hear adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And The Paranormal with Jason. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. Oh, and you just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This 5-Minute Mystery is being brought to you by These Are Your Stories, the new podcast from Ron's Amazing Stories. You can find it published weekly on the main website on the blog page. Now, here is our story. Uh, Inspector Howard, I asked to have you come up here today because I wanted to explain this case in person. Well, I'm anxious to hear about it, sir. On the 654 train from Chicago West today, there'll be a private car... In that car will be James Mayhew. He's carrying with him almost a million dollars in jewels, which he wishes to take to the West Coast. He trusts no one with them. Whew. Now, I want you to watch the entrance to that private car like a hawk. One of our trainmen, Mr. Barnes, will join you at the train. He'll have a letter from me. All right, sir. I'll do my best to prevent an accident. You know, I've been a right old man all my life, Inspector. Used to be a conductor right on one of these trains. Yes, I know. You showed me that in the letter when you met me in Chicago. Uh, By the way, uh, you're sure Mayhew is alone in there? Yes, except for the steward. You know, though, I think I'll just step back there and see if everything's all right before it's time for him to go to bed. Okay, I'll wait here for you. Mr. Inspector! Mr. Inspector! Yeah, what's the matter? I'm the steward for Mr. Mayhew's car, sir. An awful thing has happened. Yeah, what is it? Well, they, they sent me to the galley for something. Well, sir, when I came back, Mr. Barnes was gone, and there was Mr. Mayhew shot, sir. Shot right through the head. Well, come on. Let's get in there fast. Where is he? Right there, sir. Right there on the floor. Yeah. He's dead, all right. Now, where's Barnes? I don't know, sir. I don't know. He, he was gone when I came back. Yeah, what's that? Uh, I don't know, sir. Hey, quick. It's in that locker. Open it up. Uh, Barnes! What's happened? Here, wait, I'll have that gag off in a jiffy. Uh, Boy, that's Stuart. Hold him. Grab him quick before he gets away. No, no. He hit me over the head and then bound and gagged me. I came to when he put me in that locker there. Then I heard a shot. His, his Mayhew... Yes, he's dead, Barnes. Shot through the head. The the jewels. I haven't had time to look. Search the steward. He has them. He'd planned to throw me off the train and make his getaway at the next stop. Uh, Did you notice what time it was when you came to, Barnes? Yes, I did. I got my hands free and I could see through one of the air holes. It was nine minutes to eleven. I didn't do it, sir. I swear I didn't. I'm sure you didn't, Stuart. In fact, just to prove it, Barnes, I'm I'm putting you under arrest. At least until we can reach Chicago by telephone. In just a moment, we'll see why the inspector arrested Barnes instead of the steward. But first... Well, as stories go, this one is pretty good. We have a huge motive in those diamonds, and a recluse diamond courier is a nice touch. I really don't know what the clue was, which is often the case with these things. So, let's go see. And now, back to our five-minute mystery. Me? Under arrest? Yes, Barnes, you made one mistake, and I'm willing to take a chance that'll hang you. When I asked you what time it was, you said it was nine minutes to eleven. Any railroad man with the experience the real Barnes has had would naturally say 1051. You've been impersonating Barnes, went in and shot Mayhew, and locked yourself in the locker, gagged. And just to prove it... No, no, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, the jewels are right here in your pocket. Yeah, nice work, Barnes, but not nice enough. Okay, they lost me. Just because he said time just a bit different than he should have, he's a thief and a murderer, it's a good thing he had those diamonds on him. Just saying. This mystery was brought to you by the new podcast, These Are Your Stories. Listen to it today on your very own blog page. Welcome 
to the podcast, and happy Thanksgiving. On the show today, we're in for a treat. We have a brand new edition of The Paranormal with Jason, and we finish up our story from last week called The Misplaced Battleship. So grab your turkey leg, and here is Jason Dowd. What is the paranormal? Experts tell us that it is the events or phenomenon that are beyond the scope of normal scientific understanding. But it's more than that. To people like Jason Dowd, it is a way of life. He faces each day in hopes of finding the answers to questions that few would think to ask or would want to ask. Welcome to The Paranormal with Jason. Well, Jason, welcome back to The Paranormal with Jason. Um, This is number three? It is number three, yes. And I tell you, the response so far has been really positive to both The Paranormal with Jason and Ghost Stories with Sylvia, the new format. People are liking it. And I want to thank you for doing these. These are a lot of fun for me, and I know you enjoy them. I do enjoy them. You know why? Because I love talking about ghosts. I love talking about things that I'm really passionate about. And it's been so long since I've been able to go out and, and do this stuff that it's just fun to be able to talk about some of the old adventures. But I am going to Savannah in uh, this coming weekend, and I'm going to be staying in one of the most haunted hotels in the area. So hopefully I'll have a lot of great stuff to talk about when I get back, because I want to be, I want something to happen. Come on, man. Something's got to happen to me. Well, make sure you take some pictures for us so we can include them in the show notes. Oh, you know I will. All right. Well, and when you take pictures, they're like nobody else's pictures. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, on Tuesday, you were on our very special new These Are Your Stories podcast, and you told us a story. Do you remember doing that? I think so. Yeah, I do. Well, you told a story about a recurring dream that you have and had until quite recently that would come back about being buried alive, essentially. And uh, if you haven't heard Jason's story, you can go to the website, click on the blog page, and you'll see it right there, and you can listen to the story real time. Jason, I've got email. Would you, can I just start this thing right now and read this email? Yeah, go ahead. I want, let's get into it. Well, it comes from Spencer Johnson, who lives in Alberta, Canada. Really thanking him for sending this in. Hi, Ron. Long time, first time. I love the pod. You really curate a positive vibe on the show. I'm going to stop here and say thank you, Spencer, for that. That is my goal. I want to tell you about a spooky phenomenon. I've always chalked it up to a dream, but suddenly I'm not so sure. When I was little, about three to six, I used to have nightmares, as kids will do. And as kids will do, I wake up in the middle of the night screaming and crying. I'd grab my blankets, drag them across the house, and sleep in my parents' room. And because of this, they got tired of being woke up all the time. So I would sleep on the floor. One particular night, I set up my pillow and Winnie the Pooh sleeping bag and tried to get some sleep between my parents' bed and their closet. In the moonlight, I could see the movement of their clothes in the open wardrobe. After a minute of this, the head of a huge, at least five-foot-tall praying mantis suddenly poked out. He looked at me with those alien bug eyes and cleaned itself in mantis fashion, licking its antennae and long scythe-like claws. I told myself, quite terrified, that this was just a scary dream and that I was hallucinating. There's no way a man-sized mantis was in my parents' closet. So I pulled the Winnie the Pooh sleeping bag over my head and laid there shaking with fear until sleep claimed me once again. In the morning, I got up the courage to look for the monster. Unsurprisingly, the only things I found in the closet were clothes. This experience has stuck with me as a clear and undeniable childhood memory. It has inspired a lifetime interest in mantis and the weakness of human perception. P. 
people often say, I know what I saw. But I think to myself, but what if your eyes are lying to you? Even at that young age, I knew that vision couldn't have been real. However, I have to wonder why, with little or no experiences with mantises, would I hallucinate one? It's hard for me to excuse that fact. Up until then, the creature was relatively unknown to me. Last week, I was listening to a podcast, Monsters Among Us. To my surprise, they had a caller on the show that described their paranormal experience. It was almost identical to mine. A giant praying mantis. The host, Derek Hayes, then went on to describe, one after another, more tales of giant, out-of-place mantises that sent shivers up and down my spine. I consider myself fairly skeptical and have moved on from my mantis man years ago. But now I'm wondering how others could have had the same experience and what does it mean? Are the mantises common in the human zeitgeist, a figure that people will collectively hallucinate? Do they have some Jungian meaning, and why do I love them so much after such a terrifying experience? Was this just a dream, or was it a weird psychic contact with aliens from another reality? So many questions, and so few answers. I don't think I'll ever know what I experienced. I guess what I really want to know is if anyone else has seen a giant mantis man. I'd love to hear their stories, too. Spencer Johnson, Alberta, Canada. Well, Jason, I think we have something to talk about. What do you think? Yeah, I think we do. That's a pretty intense thing. Well, for a three- to six-year-old to have it be such a part of their lives up until their adulthood. And very much like you explained to us on Tuesday with being buried alive, you indicated that to this day you love graveyards. Why in the world would someone that has a fear of being buried alive want to be part of a graveyard? And I know you have an answer for that. I do. I always kind of go by the idea that just because you fall off a bike, you can't not ride the bike the rest of your life because you're going to be missing out on things. You're not going to be able to ride with your friends and, you know, you're not going to get the exercise. So even though you fall, you have to get back on it and try it. And I had to face my fear. I knew that it really was, it could have been real. It could have been like a past life experience. I could have had a psychic vision. There's, there's so many things that could have caused that to happen. And for a while, I was afraid to go into uh, graveyards. I mean, it's just, it's a natural thing to deal with. But I had to get back up on my horse and I had to go in there and I had to face that fear. And now that I have, I even stay at there, stay there at nighttime sometime. So facing your fear is one of the most important challenges we as humans have because our natural reaction is to never do it again. But then you got to think about what you're missing out on. And for me, I don't want to miss out on anything. So that's why I did it. But I get other people why they wouldn't necessarily want to get it back up on there and just run to a cemetery or like that kid going up there and opening up your closet at nighttime. I mean, that's a true fear. Mm -hmm. And for the people that stand up to it, I applaud them. Well, I did a little research and I found some meaning to the mantis. So let, really? yeah, I did. And let me just read this to you. This is just some things that I found. Seeing a praying mantis can be considered to be good luck or bad, depending upon your culture. Because of the praying hands, some Christians say that the praying mantis represents spiritualism or piety. And if you found one in your home, it may even mean that angels are watching over you. Some Muslims say that the praying mantis is always facing towards Mecca. However, in Italy, some believe that if a praying mantis looks at you menacingly, you're going to get sick. And get this, in Japan, they believe that it's a foretelling of your death. Wow. Now, so that's kind of the, the meanings that have been associated with mantises in the past, but that's not it. Mantis aliens are a real thing. Uh, and in fact, they're considered one of the most mysterious and unsettling of all the extraterrestrial creatures. Wow. 
these beings seem to appear with many of the abduction scenarios, with abductees reporting the ominous presence of these entities looming over their beds as they wake in the dead of the night. So, they're not widely as reported as, like, let's say, the Grey and Nordic. One has to wonder what Spencer saw. Could it have been one of these aliens peeking in from a different dimension? Wow. I mean, there's a lot to this. Yeah. I'd say I didn't know that. And honestly, when you talk about a mantis, they're actually predators to me. Mm -hmm. In in real life, they are predators because they literally eat the uh, they eat wasps, they eat insects. I mean, they destroy them and they even eat the head off of the off of their mate. I mean, I wouldn't have seen that as something as good luck. But that's a really interesting concept of how people use these different types of symbols and stuff in their cultures and how they view them. It's I, I, that was really interesting. Do you think that there's something to this? The little boy was scared. This sure. creature pokes its head out. Doesn't do anything really menacing, other than poke his head out in glances. What about guardian angels? How would they appear? Could they appear as a menacing mantis? Why wouldn't they? I I mean, technically, they're non-human anyways. So if there's something that we were that they're trying to get through to you to scare you enough, they may appear as something like that in order to wake you up a little bit and maybe make you think about what you're going to do. Maybe it's not the best thing to do. (laughs) Uh, I truly believe in demons being the same way. I've I've seen the demon that was in my house and it was like a GQ model. (laughs) <laughs> you know, if I would have seen that thing, I would have gone anywhere with him because I trusted him. He built the trust up. So why wouldn't a a angel who would give you that trust and that that comfort just by seeing it change their appearance to maybe make you see something that changes your mind? And maybe it's it's giving you that warning. So, sure, I don't see why that couldn't happen. I remember as a child, I had a dream that... Any time that there, I, I'm not sure it was a dream, but maybe just a, an imagination is a better word for it. But every time it thundered and lightning, I would get this picture in my head, this is going to sound crazy, of Jesus with his hand on the bolt, riding that bolt to the ground. Wow. And that stuck with me for years and years. And to this day, when I hear lightning, I think of that same thing of Jesus holding onto that bolt coming to earth. And th- it's a very personal thing. I don't know that I've ever even shared that with you before. No, you haven't, not me. But it's something that, that is real to me. And then you, you look at this kid, uh, th- what did I say, three to six years old, has this encounter with this closet, and it goes on to a lifetime love of taking care of mantises. And in your case, a terrifying dream of being buried alive takes you to what you do now. Mm-hmm. I I think that those types of dreams shape us as people. And so our perception of whatever happens becomes kind of our calling card for adulthood, if that makes any sense at all. It does. It makes a lot of sense. I, I'm living proof of it. Well, and it, it appears so is um, Spencer. Mm-hmm. And he, I guess you could stretch the point to me uh, with my lightning bolt. I I think it's a fascinating idea that we don't know if this was a dream or if he really saw something in the closet. I don't think he's sure. And you yourself said, well, you know that you weren't buried alive, at least not yet. But yet it felt so very real to you. Right. And, And like I said, for me, the lightning bolt. So what I'd like to do is... If you have experiences like this where dreams have somehow impacted your life, tell us about it. I want to hear it from you because this, to me, is a fascinating idea of dreams versus reality versus who we are. Like, I, like you said, I had this thing and this dream and it kind of put me to where I am today. He had that dream or what he thinks may be a dream or, or it could be reality set him to where he is today. This is exactly why. I believe that if a child comes to you with some crazy story, that you don't just dismiss it as crazy. Try to get into the bottom of it. Talk to them a little bit. Don't just say, oh, there's nothing there. Oh, that never happened. Or you're crazy. 
don't dismiss it. Embrace them. And that might help them along the way too to A, not feel like they're crazy and B, know that you're on their side, but that might encourage them to further explore things down the line. Everybody has these dreams and sometimes they've been turned into ghost hunters. Sometimes they've been turned into people that, that follow aliens and, and, and look to the sky and who knows, they might find a new constellation. They might find a, a new galaxy. Only because they ran into something that they thought was an alien, you know. So this is this is important for the, for I think all of us to understand that we should not just quickly dismiss somebody for for the dream that they had or an experience that they believe was to be true or not. Jason, that that could lead to first contact. Yeah. True first contact. That's exactly right. Well, Jason, this was exactly what I'd hoped to be—a pretty spirited conversation. Jason, can you sum this up for us? Yeah. What we have here is a story of a child that saw something that he didn't know if it was real or not. However, he didn't let it keep him down. And he took his ideas and what he saw. And now he's doing something spectacular for a species of insects that do play a vital role in our, in our ecology. So this is where I believe that we need to embrace what we see. And don't be afraid of it, no matter how scary it is or how amazing it is. Embrace it and do some research into it. And you never know. It can open up some amazing doors for you along the way. It might change the world. And it can all come down to one specific incident in your life. For me, being buried alive brought me into an idea of what death could be forced me to read and learn other religions, which helped me relate to other people better. It also allowed me to become an artist because I could take these graphic ideas and put them into something that would shock people and create a story and create a conversation. So just take it, run with it. Don't be afraid of what you see. And if you need to do some research, research it. And you never know what it's going to lead to down the line for you or somebody else that you come in contact with. Well, thank you for that, Jason. I think this was one of the better Paranormals with Jason that we've had. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad we were able to discuss these things. And I hope everybody enjoys and keep listening because I'll be here with more stories for you in the future. One last thing uh, that I would like is if people want to go see those photos that you're talking about, uh, where can they go? Imaginationartstudios.com. I M A G I N E N A T I O N Art Studios with an S at the end.com. And I will have that link in the show notes. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome, Ron. Bye, everybody. That's it for this time. If you want to contact Jason, I will have links in the show notes. Now it's time for our featured story. Our featured story this week is the conclusion to The Misplaced Battleship. The work was originally published in the April 1960 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. If you missed parts one and two, you can stop here and go back to episode number 466. Last week, we met James Decrease, a.k.a. the Stainless Steel Rat. He was a con man of some skill, but was caught by the Special Corps and given the choice of prison or becoming one of their agents. His first assignment? Well, to track down and recover a missing space-fearing battleship. He heads to the second planet of a B-star in Corona Borealis, where he impersonates a general to get to the bottom of the mystery. After much research, James discovered an inspired master criminal. His name, undoubtedly a pseudonym, is Pepe Nero, and his accomplice is a girl named Angelina. He thanked the people of Corona Borealis and parted with these words. The League fleet is already closing in on the Renegades, and you will be informed of the capture. Thank you for your assistance. What you will hear today are parts three and four, which will conclude the story. Here is the misplaced battleship read for us by our old friend, 
Phil Shenevert. Section 3 of The Misplaced Battleship by Harry Harrison I threw them as snappy a salute as I could muster, and they filed out. Staring gloomily at their backs, I envied for one moment their simple faith in the League Navy, when in reality the vengeful fleet was just as imaginary as my admiral's rating. This was still a job for the Corps. Inskip would have to be given the latest information at once. I had sent him a psigram about the theft, but there was no answer as yet. Maybe the identity of the thieves would stir some response out of him. My message was in code, but it could be quickly broken if someone wanted to try hard enough. I took it to the message center myself. The Psy Man was in his transparent cubicle, and I locked myself in with him. His eyes were unfocused as he spoke softly into a mic, pulling in a message from somewhere across the galaxy. Outside, the rushing transcribers copied, coded, and filed messages, but no sound penetrated the insulated wall. I waited until his attention clicked back into the room and handed him the sheets of paper. League Central 14, Rush, I told him. He raised his eyebrows, but didn't ask any questions. Establishing contact only took a few seconds, as they had an entire battery of psi-men for their communications. He read the code words carefully, shaping them with his mouth, but not speaking aloud, the power of his thoughts carrying across the light years of distance. As soon as he was finished, I took back the sheet, tore it up, and pocketed the pieces. I had my answer back quickly enough. Inskip must have been hovering around, waiting for my message. The mic was turned off to the transcribers outside, and I took the code groups down in shorthand myself. XYBB, DFIL, FDNO, and if you don't, don't come back. The message broke into clear at the end, and the Psyman smiled as he spoke the words. I broke the point off my stylus and growled at him not to repeat any of this message, as it was classified, and I would personally see him shot if he did. That got rid of the smile, but didn't make me feel any better. The decoded message turned out not to be as bad as I had imagined. Until further notice, I was in charge of tracking and capturing the stolen battleship. I could call on the League for any aid I needed. I would keep my identity as an admiral for the rest of the job. I was to keep him informed of progress. Only those ominous last words in clear kept my happiness from being complete. I had been handed my long-awaited assignment, but translated into simple terms, my orders were to get the battleship, or it would be my neck. Never a word about my efforts in uncovering the plot in the first place. This is a heartless world we live in. This moment of self-pity relaxed me, and I immediately went to bed. Since my main job now was waiting, I could wait just as well asleep. And waiting was all I could do. Of course, there were secondary tasks, such as ordering a naval cruiser for my own use, and digging for more information on the thieves. But these really were secondary to my main purpose, which was waiting for bad news. There was no place I could go that would be better situated for the chase than Sidonuvo. The missing ship could have gone in any direction. With each passing minute, the sphere of probable locations grew larger by the power of the squared cube. I kept the on-watch crew of the cruiser at duty stations and confined the rest within a one-hundred-yard radius of the ship. There was little more information on Pepe and Angelina. They had covered their tracks well. Their origin was unknown, though the fact they both talked with a slight accent suggested an off-world origin. There was one dim picture of Pepe, chubby but looking too grim to be a happy fat boy. There was no picture of the girl. I shuffled the meager findings, controlled my impatience, and kept the ship's psi man busy pulling in all reports of any kind of trouble in space. The navigator and I plotted their locations in his tank, comparing the positions in relation to the growing sphere that enclosed all the possible locations of the stolen ship. Some of the disasters and apparent accidents hit inside this area, 
but further investigation proved them all to have natural causes. I had left standing orders that all reports falling inside the danger area were to be brought to me at any time. The messenger woke me from a deep sleep, turning on the light and handing me the slip of paper. I blinked myself awake, read the first two lines, and pressed the action station alarm over my bunk. I'll say this, the Navy boys know their business. When the siren screamed, the crew secured ship and blasted off before I had finished reading the report. As soon as my eyeballs unsquashed back into focus, I read it through, then once more, carefully, from the beginning. It looked like the one we had been waiting for. There were no witnesses to the tragedy, but a number of monitor stations had picked up the discharge static of a large energy weapon being fired. Triangulation had led investigators to the spot where they found a freighter, August's Dream, with a hole punched through it as big as a railroad tunnel. The freighter's cargo of plutonium was gone. I read Pepe in every line of the message. Since he was flying an undermanned battleship, he had used it in the most efficient way possible. If he attempted to negotiate or threaten another ship, the element of chance would be introduced. So he had simply roared up to the unsuspecting freighter and blasted her with the monster guns his battleship packed. All eighteen men aboard had been killed instantly. The thieves were now murderers. I was under pressure now to act and under a greater pressure not to make any mistakes. Roly-poly Pepe had shown himself to be a ruthless killer. He knew what he wanted, then reached out and took it, destroying anyone who stood in his way. More people would die before this was over. It was up to me to keep that number as small as possible. Ideally, I should have rushed out the fleet with guns blazing and dragged him to justice. Very nice, and I wished it could be done that way. Except, where was he? A battleship may be gigantic on some terms of reference, but in the immensity of the galaxy it is microscopically infinitesimal. As long as it stayed out of the regular lanes of commerce and clear of detector stations and planets, it would never be found. Then how could I find it, and having found it, catch it? When the infernal thing was more than a match for any ship it might meet, that was my problem. It had kept me awake nights and talking to myself days, since there was no easy answer. I had to construct a solution slowly and carefully. Since I couldn't be sure where Pepe was going to be next, I had to make him go where I wanted him to. There were some things in my favor. The most important was the fact I had forced him to make his play before he was absolutely ready. It wasn't chance that he had left the same day I arrived on Sidanuvo. Any plan as elaborate as his certainly included warning of approaching danger. The drive on the battleship, as well as controls and primary armament, had been installed weeks before I showed up. Much of the subsidiary work remained to be done when the ship had left. One witness of the theft had graphically described the power lines and cables dangling from the ship's locks when she lifted. My arrival had forced Pepe off balance. Now I had to keep pushing until he fell. This meant I had to think as he did, fall into his plan, think ahead, then trap him, set a thief to catch a thief. A great theory, only I felt uncomfortably on the spot when I tried to put it into practice. A drink helped, as did a cigar. Puffing on it, staring at the smooth bulkhead, relaxed me a bit. After all, there aren't that many things you can do with a battleship. You can't run a big con, blow safes, or make bermadex with it. It is hell on jets for space piracy, but that's about all. Great, great. But why a battleship? I was talking to myself, normally a bad sign, but right now I didn't care. The mood of space piracy had seized me, and I had been going along fine, until this glaring inconsistency jumped out and hit me square in the eye. Why a battleship? Why all the trouble and years of work to get a ship that two people could just barely manage? 
With a tenth of the effort, Pepe could have had a cruiser that would have suited his purposes just as well. Just as good for space piracy, that is, but not for his purposes. He had wanted a battleship, and he had gotten himself a battleship, which meant he had more in mind than simple piracy. What? It was obvious that Pepe was a monomaniac, an egomaniac, and as psychotic as a sharded computer. Some day the mystery of how he had slipped through the screen of official testing would have to be investigated. That wasn't my concern now. He still had to be caught. A plan was beginning to take shape in my head, but I didn't rush it. First I had to be sure that I knew him well. Any man that can con an entire world into building a battleship for him, then steal it from them, is not going to stop there. The ship would need a crew, a base for refueling, and a mission. Fuel had to be taken care of first. The gutted hull of Agat's dream was silent witness to that. There were countless planets that could be used as a base. Getting a crew would be more difficult in these peaceful times, although I could think of a few answers to that one, too. Raid the mental hospitals and jails. Do that often enough, and you would have a crew that would make any pirate chief proud. Though piracy was, of course, too mean an ambition to ascribe to this boy. Did he want to rule a whole planet, or maybe an entire system, or more? I shuddered a bit as the thought hit me. Was there really anything that could stop a plan like this once it got rolling? During the Kingly Wars, any number of types with a couple of ships and less brains than Pepe had set up just this kind of empire. They were all pulled down at the end, since their success depended on one-man rule, but the price that had to be paid first. This was the plan, and I felt in my bones that I was right. I might be wrong on some of the minor details. They weren't important. I knew the general outline of the idea, just as when I bumped into a mark, I knew how much he could be taken for, and just how to do it. There are natural laws in crime, as in every other field of human endeavor. I knew this was it. Get the communications officer in here at once, I shouted at the intercom. Also a couple of clerks with transcribers, and fast, this is a matter of life or death. This last had a hollow ring and I realized my enthusiasm had carried me out of character. I buttoned my collar, straightened my ribbons, and squared my shoulders. By the time they knocked on the door, I was all admiral again. Acting on my orders, the ship dropped out of warp drive so our psimen could get through to the other operators. Captain Sting grumbled as we floated there. With the engines silent, wasting precious days, while half his crew was involved in getting out what appeared to be insane instructions. My plan was beyond his understanding, which is of course why he is a captain and I'm an admiral, even a temporary one. Following my orders, the navigator again constructed a sphere of speculation in his tank. The surface of the sphere contacted all the star systems a day's flight ahead of the maximum flight of the stolen battleship, there weren't too many of these at first, and the Psyman could handle them all, calling each in turn and sending by news release to the naval public relations officers there. As the sphere kept growing, he started to drop behind, steadily losing ground. By this time I had a general release prepared, along with directions for use and follow-up, which he sent to Central 14. The battery of Simon there contacted the individual planets, and all we had to do was keep adding to the list of planets. The release and follow-ups all harped on one theme. I expanded on it, waxed enthusiastic, condemned it, and worked it into an interview. I wrote as many variations as I could, so it could be slipped into as many different formats as possible, in one form or another. I wanted the basic information in every magazine, newspaper, and journal inside that expanding sphere. What in the devil does this nonsense mean? Captain Sting asked peevishly. He had long since given up the entire operation as a futile one, and spent most of the time in his cabin worrying about the effect of it on his service record. 
Boredom or curiosity had driven him out, and he was reading one of my releases with horror. Billionaire to found own world? Space shot filled with luxuries to last a hundred years? The captain's face grew red as he flipped through the stack of notes. What connection does this tripe have with catching those murderers? End of Section 3 the fourth and final section of The Misplaced Battleship by Harry Harrison. When we were alone, he was anything but courteous to me, having assured himself by not too subtle questioning that I was a spurious admiral. There was no doubt I was still in charge, but our relationship was anything but formal. This tripe and nonsense, I told him, is the bait that will snag our fish, a trap for Pepe and his partner in crime. Who is this mysterious billionaire? Me, I said. I've always wanted to be rich. But this ship, the space yacht, where is it? Being built now in the naval shipyard at Udridi. We're almost ready to go there now, soon as this batch of instructions goes out. Captain Stang dropped his releases onto the table, then carefully wiped his hands off to remove any possible infection. He was trying to be fair and considerate of my views, and not succeeding in the slightest. It doesn't make sense, he growled. How can you be sure this killer will ever read one of those things? And if he does, why should he be interested? It looks to me as if you are wasting time while he slips through your fingers. The alarm should be out and every ship notified. The Navy alerted and patrols set on all space lanes which he could easily avoid by going around, or better yet, not even bothering about, since he can lick any ship we have. That's not the answer, I told him. This Pepe is smart and as tricky as a fixed gambling machine. That's his strength and his weakness as well. Characters like that never think it possible for someone else to outthink them, which is what I'm going to do. Modest, aren't you? Sting said. I try not to be, I told him. False modesty is the refuge of the incompetent. I'm going to catch this thug, and I'll tell you how I'll do it. He's going to hit again soon, and wherever he hits, there will be some kind of a periodical with my plant in it. Whatever else he is after, he's going to take all of the magazines and papers he can find, partly to satisfy his own ego— but mostly to keep track of the things he is interested in, such as ship sailings. You're just guessing. You don't know all this. His automatic assumption of my incompetence was beginning to get me annoyed. I bridled my temper and tried one last time. Yes, I'm guessing, an informed guess, but I do know some facts as well. Agat's dream was cleaned out of all reading matter, that was one of the first things I checked. We can't stop the battleship from attacking again, but we can see to it that the time after that she sails into a trap. I don't know, the captain said. It sounds to me like... I never heard what it sounded like, which is all right since he was getting under my skin and might have been tempted to pull my pseudo-rank. The alarm sirens cut his sentence off, and we foot-raced to the communications room. Captain Stang won by a nose. It was his ship, and he knew all the shortcuts. The Psyman was holding out a transcription, but he summed it up in one sentence. He looked at me while he talked, and his face was hard and cold. They hit again, knocked out a Navy supply satellite, thirty-four men dead. If your plan doesn't work, Admiral, the captain whispered hoarsely in my ear, I'll personally see that you're flayed alive. If my plan doesn't work, Captain, there won't be enough of my skin left to pick up with a tweezer. Now, if you please, I'd like to get to you ready and pick up my ship as soon as possible. The easygoing hatred and contempt of all my associates had annoyed me, thrown me off balance. I was thinking with anger now, not with logic. Forcing a bit of control, I ordered my thoughts, checking off a mental list. Belay that last command, I shouted, getting back into my old space dog mood. Get a call through first and find out if any of our plants were picked up during the raid. While the Psyman unfocused his eyes and mumbled under his breath, 
I riffled some papers, relaxed and cool. The ratings and officers waited tensely, and made some slight attempt to conceal their hatred of me. It took about ten minutes to get an answer. Affirmative, the Psy man said. A storeship docked there twenty hours before the attack. Among other things, it left newspapers containing the article. Very good, I said calmly. Send a general order to suspend all future activity with the planted releases. Send it by Simon only. No mention on any other naval signaling equipment. There's a good chance now it might be overheard. I strolled out slowly, in command of the situation, keeping my face turned away so they couldn't see the cold sweat. It was a fast run to Uridi, where my billionaire's yacht, the El Dorado, was waiting. The dockyard commander showed me the ship, and made a noble effort to control his curiosity. I took a sadistic revenge on the Navy by not telling him a word about my mission. After checking out the controls and special apparatus with the technicians, I cleared the ship. There was a tape in the automatic navigator that would put me on the course mentioned in all the articles. Just a press of a button and I would be on my way. I pressed the button. It was a beautiful ship and the dockyard had been lavished with their attention to detail. From bow to rear tubes she was plated in pure gold. There are other metals with a higher albedo, but none that gives a richer effect. All the fittings, inside and out, were either machine-turned or plated. All this work could not have been done in the time allotted. The Navy must have adapted a luxury yacht to my needs. Everything was ready. Either Pepe would make his move, or I would sail on to my billionaire's paradise planet. If that happened, it would be best if I stayed there. Now that I was in space, past the point of no return, all the doubts that I had dismissed fought for attention. The plan that had seemed so clear and logical now began to look like a patched and crazy makeshift. Hold on there, sailor, I said to myself, using my best admiral's voice. Nothing has changed. It's still the best and only plan possible under the circumstances. Was it? Could I be sure that Pepe, flying his mountain of a ship and eating Navy rations, would be interested in some of the comforts and luxuries of life? Or if the luxuries didn't catch his eye, would he be interested in the planetary homesteading gear? I had loaded the cards with all the things he might want, and planted the information where he could get it. He had the bait now, but would he grab the hook? I couldn't tell and I could work myself into a neurotic state if I kept running through the worry cycle. It took an effort to concentrate on anything else, but it had to be made. The next four days passed very slowly. When the alarm blew off, all I felt was an intense sensation of relief. I might be dead and blasted to dust in the next few minutes, but that didn't seem to make much difference. Pepe had swallowed the bait. There was only one ship in the galaxy that could knock back a blip that big at such a distance. It was closing fast, using the raw energy of the battleship engines for a headlong approach. My ship bucked a bit as the tug beams locked on at maximum distance. The radio bleeped at me for attention at the same time. I waited as long as I dared, then flipped it on. The voice boomed out, that you are under the guns of a warship. Don't attempt to run, signal, take evasive action, or in any other way. Who are you and what the devil do you want? I sputtered into the mic. I had my scanner on so they could see me, but my own screen stayed dark. They weren't sending any picture. In a way, it made my act easier. I just played to an unseen audience. They could see the rich cut of my clothes, the luxurious cabin behind me. Of course, they couldn't see my hands. It doesn't matter who we are, the radio boomed again. Just obey orders if you care to live. Stay away from the controls until we have tied on, then do exactly as I say. There were two distant clangs as magnetic grapples hit the hull. A little later, the ship lurched, drawn home against the battleship. I let my eyes roll in fear, looking around for a way to escape, and taking a peek at the outside scanners. The yacht was flush against the space-filling bulk of the other ship. I pressed the button that sent the torch-wielding robot on his way. 
Now let me tell you something, I snapped into the mic, wiping away the worried billionaire expression. First, I'll repeat your own warning. Obey orders if you want to live. I'll show you why. When I threw the big switch, a carefully worked out sequence took place. First, of course, the hull was magnetized and the bombs fused. A light blinked as the scanner in the cabin turned off and the one in the generator room came on. I checked the monitor screen to make sure, then started into the spacesuit. It had to be done fast at the same time it was necessary to talk naturally. They must think of me as sitting in the control room. That's the ship's generators you're looking at, I said. Ninety-eight percent of their output is now feeding into coils that make an electromagnet of this ship's hull. You will find it very hard to separate us, and I would advise you not to try. The suit was on, and I kept the running chatter up through the mic in the helmet, relaying to the ship's transmitter. The scene in the monitor receiver changed. You are now looking at a hydrogen bomb that is primed and aware of the magnetic field holding our ships together. It will, of course, go off if you try to pull away. I grabbed up the monitor receiver and ran towards the airlock. This is a different bomb now, I said, keeping one eye on the screen and the other on the slowly opening outer door. This one has receptors on the hull. Attempt to destroy any part of this ship or even gain entry to it, and this one will detonate. I was in space now, leaping across to the gigantic wall of the other ship. What do you want? These were the first words Pepe had spoken since his first threats. I want to talk to you, arrange a deal, something that would be profitable for both of us. But let me first show you the rest of the bombs, so you won't get any strange ideas about cooperating. Of course, I had to show him the rest of the bombs. There was no getting out of it. The scanners in the ship were following a planned program. I made light talk about all my massive armament that would carry us both to perdition while I climbed through the hole in the battleship's hull. There was no armor or warning devices at this spot. It had been chosen carefully from the blueprints. Yeah, yeah, I take your word for it. You're a flying bomb. So stop with this roving report a bit and tell me what you have in mind. This time I didn't answer him because I was running and panting like a dog and had the mic turned off. Just ahead, if the blueprints were right, was the door to the control room. Pepe should be there. I stepped through, gun out, and pointed it at the back of his head. Angelina stood next to him, looking at the screen. The game's over, I said. Stand up slowly and keep your hands in sight. What do you mean? He said angrily, looking at the screen in front of him. The girl caught Wise first. She spun around and pointed. He's here. They both stared, gaped at me, caught off guard and completely unprepared. You're under arrest, Crime King, I told him, and your girlfriend. Angelina rolled her eyes up and slid slowly to the floor. Real or faked, I didn't care. I kept the gun on Pepe's pudgy form while he picked her up and carried her to an acceleration couch against the wall. What, what will happen now? He quavered the last question. His pouchy jaws shook, and I swear there were tears in his eyes. I was not impressed by his acting, since I could clearly remember the dead men floating in space. He stumbled over to a chair, half dropping into it. Will they do anything to me? Angelina asked. Her eyes were open now. I have no idea what will happen to you, I told her truthfully. That is up to the courts to decide. But he made me do all those things, she wailed. She was young, dark, and beautiful. The tears did nothing to spoil this. Pepe dropped his face into his hands, and his shoulders shook. I flicked the gun his way and snapped at him. Sit up, Pepe. I find it very hard to believe that you are crying. There are some naval ships on the way now. The automatic alarm was triggered about a minute ago. I'm sure they'll be glad to see the man who— Don't let them take me, please. Angelina was on her feet now, her back pressed to the wall. They'll put me in prison, do things to my mind. She shrunk away as she spoke, stumbling along the wall. I looked back at Pepe, not wanting to have my eyes off him for an instant. There's nothing I can do, I told her. 
I glanced her way, and a small door was swinging open, and she was gone. Don't try to run, I shouted after her. It can't do any good. Pepe made a strangling noise, and I looked back to him quickly. He was sitting up now, and his face was dry of tears. In fact, he was laughing, not crying. So she caught you, too, Mr. Wise Cop. Poor little Angelina with the soft eyes. He broke down again, shaking with laughter. What do you mean? I growled. Don't you catch on yet? The story she told you was true, except she twisted it around a bit. The whole plan, building the battleship, then stealing it, was hers. She pulled me into it, played me like an accordion. I fell in love with her, hating myself and happy at the same time. Well, I'm glad now it's over. At least I gave her a chance to get away. I owe her that much. Though I thought I would explode when she went into that innocence act. The cold feeling was now a ball of ice that threatened to paralyze me. You're lying, I said hoarsely, and even I didn't believe it. Sorry, that's the way it is. Your brain boys will pick my skull to pieces and find out the truth anyway. There's no point in lying now. We'll search the ship. She can't hide for long. She won't have to, Pepe said. There's a fast scout we picked up, stowed in one of the holes. That must be it leaving now. We could feel the vibration distantly through the floor. The Navy will get her, I told him, with far more conviction than I felt. Maybe, he said, suddenly slumped and tired, no longer laughing. Maybe they will, but I gave her her chance. It's all over for me now, but she knows that I loved her to the end. He bared his teeth in sudden pain. Not that she will care in the slightest. I kept the gun on him, and neither of us moved while the Navy ships pulled up and their boots stamped outside. I had captured my battleship and the raids were over, and I couldn't be blamed if the girl had slipped away. If she evaded the Navy ships, that was their fault, not mine. I had my victory all right. Then why did it taste like ashes in my mouth? It's a big galaxy, but it wasn't going to be big enough to hide Angelina now. I can be con once, but only once. The next time we meet, things were going to be very different. What an amazing story. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of the stainless steel rat and its author, Harry Harrison. There are a total of 12 novels in this series. You have The Stainless Steel Rat Gets Drafted, The Stainless Steel Rat for president, and the most recent title, The Stainless Steel Rat, The Golden Years. They are quick reads and will capture your attention immediately. You just won't be able to put them down. They are also available as audiobooks on audible.com. I hope that you enjoyed this story. I know I did. episode number 467 and I want to thank you for being with us today. I also want to thank Jason for being here and I hope that you and your family have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> if you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it, and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories.